my role at Time Inc. is currently Vice President of Engineering for Consumer Marketing Technology Services. This is a vertical role providing all of the data and analytics as well as the applications for consumer marketing as well as the end-to-end -end technology that, that drives consumer marketing through fulfillment. Up until last month, my role was VP of Engineering for Revenue and Data Engineering. And in that role, I incubated Time Inc.'s new big data platform. In the late 1990s, Time Inc. built a segmentation engine data platform. And so we were modernizing that and bringing it forward to current technology. So the role represents another step in the Time Inc. data journey because the first role was a consolidated team that included the platform as well as the advertising vertical, the consumer marketing vertical for data. With this new, the new structure, there's a, an engineer who owns the data platform and another vice president of engineering that owns the advertising vertical and now I own the consumer marketing and also do the heavy lifting for the finance vertical as well. Well, the most, uh, there's several things. One is I, I lead a large team. My team is over 300 people. And so it's a leader of leaders job. And what I do is I focus on the most high priority projects. The things that we're incubating that we're just getting started, helping land the strategy both technically and with the business owners, making sure we're focusing on the most important work. I use three methods when I'm figuring out what work to do day to day. One of them is, am I managing the present well? And for that one, I've developed agile teams within my group that are partnered with their business counterparts. And so I want to look at how well we're delivering there. I want to know if there's any problems in that space that need my attention. Uh, the second one is uh, developing the future. I'm always thinking, I need to be thinking about what's next so that I keep my engineers engaged and we're delivering that business value. And that's to the thing I, I started with in this conversation, really around the strategies and landing good technical architectures as well as figuring out what vendors we bring in and what mix of consultants and current staff we use. The third thing is managing the people. That's really important to me. I, I like to have a collaborative culture. I want people to love coming to work. I want them to enjoy being on my team. I want them to see that they provide value. So what that includes things like lunches with different groups of people, doing all hands meetings where we do the strategy, meetings with my leaders, evaluating how our employees are doing, looking for problem spots. If there's employees that are struggling, how do we help them do better? If there's some who are unhappy because of certain things, how do we help with that? And really building that good, robust, healthy team. That's a great question. Opportunities for, prog for progression are really important to the employees. And interestingly, it's different by geography. In India, I have a large staff, and those folks really want to get an opportunity to try different things. So we try to put them in a system where they can rotate to different roles, but they need to stay in the current one long enough to really learn it and provide value. So, and then also allowing them to come to the United States and have an opportunity to work with the team here. That's really important. I try to run my global team and consider everybody as, as a unique individual that's important. So in the United States, what's important to people is being able to go to conferences sometimes, where can they can learn new things, or being able to try new technology. I have an architecture team, which is kind of the pinnacle of engineering for my group. And so giving, engineers an opportunity to work with one of those architects who helps them increase their skills is another way that really keeps some of my engineers motivated. And I think the most important thing is the reward they get when they deliver something and the customers love it. So it's staying open to really listening to customers along the way and not isolating ourselves because of some way we designed it, but working iteratively, iteratively with the customer so at the end the engineer gets that satisfaction that somebody's using their product and they're happy with it. The value of their work is represented in the business use, I feel, when someone is really using the product and it's doing what the engineer had hoped. So three things is number one, a culture fit. Uh, I think that's always important that someone would, would want to come and work there and I think about a lot of variables there. I have different 
people in different stages of their career and different teams. And I want to make sure that I, if I'm bringing in a new college hire that there's other people like them. It's so important that people see others like them that they can relate to. So that's culture fit. The second one is competence in the job. I want to make sure they have the skills to do the job. Right? If they don't have the skills to even do the baseline, it's just going to be frustrating for everyone. And the third thing I look for is I like people who are very reality-based. Software always tells the truth. Right? It does whatever I tell it, whatever I've coded it to do, even if it wasn't what I intended for it to do. Right? And so I think engineers need to be very reality-based because if they're not, they're going to have a hard time making those changes improving software and really reaching that level of quality that's important to me to deliver to the business. Yes and no. It depends on the role. I have some roles where that's true. If I need someone to be able to just do HTML or some sort of scripting language. And I have groups of people where that is the case and they can learn if they have good problem solving skills. I have other areas like my deep architecture team where they really need to have demonstrated software skills and often it's really hard to get those if you didn't get a degree. But first thing, it comes down to making sure that the work we're doing aligns to the company strategy. And then I think really making sure people are happy and aligned it comes down to the line level managers. It's about me as a leader making sure that my leaders are all aligned so when they go and talk to their people, they're all aligned. And I often view myself like an orchestra conductor, right? And I have the, you know, the, the violin group and the flutes and each of those different groups are delivering something that provides value so at the end we have this suite of things that we do deliver for the business and so making sure that each of those are in harmony the other thing that i do a lot is i encourage my leaders to work problems out among themselves i don't want to have to be the arbiter i will be when there's a problem and when something needs my decision but i find that if i help my staff understand that as a collective group they do my job and encourage them to really work together and also I do leadership offsites where we bring in trainers that help with communications and working on emotional intelligence so that they have the tools to do that. So I think communications is probably the most important part of my job as a tech leader because you, it, it, when I'm asked to deliver something, I need to be able to communicate the options, I need to be able to communicate the costs, I need to be able to communicate the architecture. I often will do two slide decks. I have the business version. I, I will always say to my team, this is the logical version. And you know, everything may not be 100% accurate, but it's close enough that the business leaders can understand it because they won't understand all the details that we will. And then I build a technical deck that is used for the technical team and others in finance who might need more detail. But I'm also communicating up, I'm commuting down, I'm communicating sideways. There's a couple of rules of thumb that I follow and one is consistency. There's nothing that will cause a team of, you know, to go sideways faster at my level than not hearing the same thing day after day. Because if I set the direction and that we want to accomplish a, cur a certain goal on Monday and on Tuesday I change it, on Wednesday I change it, they're all confused by Thursday. So once I set a goal, I have a rule that says once in flight, always in flight. If we've decided that we're going to do a project, we're going to do that project. Now, if there might be some exceptions. I'm not going to be rigid. If something happens in the world and there's some urgent thing that needs our attention, we will stop and do that. But that helps my people understand that they're on a stable base for a certain period of time. That's super important. Another one is congratulating people when they do good work. It's not really hard, but if you, you know, they say that eight positives for one negative would be ideal. Many times as managers, we do the opposite. And so I try to praise people a lot when I see good things. And if I see something that I'm really pleased with, I'll stop by an employee's office and call it out. My all hands, we do awards for, for things that I see that are really good. I had a team in India, when they first came to me, they were really underutilized. And I didn't, wasn't sure of the reasons why, but I challenged those India managers to get me to 75% utilization. And when they did, we made a big deal out of it. They got cash awards, they got recognized in front of their peers. So those sorts of things are important.
Well, having executive support for data and analytics is essential because of the dollars, if nothing else. It costs, right? Storing large amounts of data costs a lot of money. And they need to feel like there's value in spending that money. And I think ultimately that is one of our biggest challenges. Data in and of itself doesn't generate revenue. Data is data. It's finding those right places to use data in a way that generates revenue or that maintains revenue and keeps it from slipping. And sometimes if the industry is changing around you, if you don't change with it, you will lose market share. So it's helping executives understand all of those different angles about it and finding the champions and leveraging them. That's the super important thing because you have people on all ends of the spectrum, right? Some who think it's really cool and some are like, why are we doing that? So finding the champions, delivering for them and then using that as a leverage. How do I prove ROI is a really hard question it, because it depends very much on the domain. So, for example, if it's a predictive uh, model, we will go out and test. We have one running right now. It's a test to determine if we model segments, not model segments, if we model people based upon our propensities, will we get a higher uptick in subscriptions? Important thing is to measure it. The nice thing about data is you can measure it. And so we measure it, we show what happens, and then we move forward from there. Data and analytics are changing marketing in very significant ways. There was a time when marketing was very blanketed, and then they went to segmentation, right? What is your age, your income bracket, zip code? Now, then we, we got to interests. Now we can start to look at how do we find people who have interests that are similar to people who have interests that, for example, buy People magazine. And how do we reach other people, people who might not know we're there. So I think the thing about data is, first of all, it runs a media business from the perspective of understanding the types of things people are going to be interested in reading. But in this new world also, it allows us to find other people that we can reach out to. And I think probably one of the most interesting things for us right now is in developing communities. Because media is changing from being an individual activity to more of a group activity. People like to hang out with people who have similar interests. They like to learn together. And we want to be able to provide that value. So for example, uh, our SI Play, Sports Illustrated Play, which is a new business that we launched last year. And that's to bring together little league types of you know, youth sports into different groups and provide all the tools and uh, things they need, not just for starting the leagues, right, to be able to bring the coaches together, to be able to pay, for people to be able to pay so money isn't stashed in somebody's home, to providing the tools that the children need to succeed, the clothing, the sports equipment, and all of those things. So it's kind of more rounded. So I think what the important thing to think about for women to get them into the field is opportunity. And then when the opportunity is there, they need to feel that the culture is welcoming for them. One of my favorite stories around this is we often hear in industry, I don't know if I, you know, that this young woman is pregnant, I'm not going to have somebody, you know, the, the whole conversation is around the impact to the business. Now, I, I think the impact of the business is important. But I also think that the service she's doing for humanity <laughs> is important too, right? So how do we change the language around events relative to women to not make them negatives so that women feel more welcome, right? The other thing is in the team, I think there's a couple of things that I've learned over the years that I find particularly valuable. One of them is, is in reviews in different places where we're discussing personnel, we talk about people. We don't need to talk about men or women or race or whatever. Let's talk about that person. What did they contribute? What did they give? How did they provide value? And then the second thing is to watch for places where unconsciously things happen that make it harder for women. So for example, if a team has a culture of staying really late and going to the bar one night, a new mother's not really going to want to participate in that. And so she's left out. So how, how does the team form around activities that make women feel welcome. 
And then I think the second and probably most important one for leaders is to watch for biases in the review process, in the promotion process. I had a group come in with a, we do promotion documents at time, and they had a woman that they were promoting, and I was thrilled to see the promotion document, but the first paragraph was all about her personal, personal issues around her. She had a baby and she came back and overcame the time. She has to work from home a lot, but she still provides value. You know, all of those things, that, that has nothing to do with whether or not I should promote her. What I wanted to know was what value did she provide to the business? What skills does she have? What opportunities should I be giving her? So changing that language and helping people understand for both men and women to look for the value they provide. And, and then I think the last thing is opportunity. It's really easy to give opportunities to people who look like the person in charge. And I think as a leader, it's my responsibility to give opportunities to any person who's ready for that opportunity. So those are the things I do in my organization. And interestingly enough, I have actually found men coming to work for me because they want to have that opportunity to be flexible and have family-friendly values for themselves because it's not always women who need that flexibility. Sometimes men do too.